Hello, my name is Ran, and this is the Flow Artist Podcast. Every episode, my co-host Joe Stewart and I speak with inspiring movers, thinkers, and teachers about how they find their flow and much, much more. I hope you're doing okay. These are certainly interesting times. Last episode, I was talking about reopening the studio, and now Melbourne is back in lockdown for six weeks. I think we're a little bit better prepared with our studio and website this time around, so it shouldn't be too bad transitioning into online classes, but I can't help but feel a little bit sad about it. It was wonderful reconnecting with our community, and Joe and I discovered that we both really miss teaching aerial yoga. I'd love to hear your thoughts though. How was the brief foray into teaching in person for you, and how do you feel about the current lockdown? You can reach out to us via Facebook or on our website at podcast.flowartist.com. We would love to hear from you. All right, so this episode features an interview with Alice Williams. Alice is a yoga teacher, writer, and the author of the book Bad Yogi. It's a fun and hilarious read where she talks about her experiences working on a very popular Australian soap opera, her yoga teacher training at CAE in Melbourne, and more seriously, how she dealt with an eating disorder. As I mentioned, it is a great read, and Joe and I both recognize a few of the characters in the book, so I recommend checking it out. Our conversation with Alice was recorded way before this whole COVID-19 experience, so if it does sound a little bit out of date with current events, I do apologize, but it's a great conversation, so have a listen. This episode was brought to you by our sponsor, Yoga Australia, registering teachers and training courses to ensure that everyone in Australia has access to quality yoga teachers. All right, let's get into our conversation with Alice Williams. All right, we're ready. Oh, thank you so much for meeting with us today, Alice. It's so great to have you here. Perhaps we could start with you just telling us a little bit about your background and where you grew up. Yeah, sure. Well, I'm very much a Melbourne girl. I've lived here all my life and I actually grew up in Northcote, so Northside. Oh, nice. And when I was quite young, we used moved to Williamstown, which is western suburbs of Melbourne. And it was a very white kind of area. So that was a bit of a shock to the system. Very, I guess, um, conservative area as well, which I kind of wasn't used to. So that was an interesting transition. And that's where I began doing yoga. And then I went to uni and like most Melbourne arts uni students dropped out pretty quickly. (laughs) I ended up going to a monastery for a little while in Nepal and that's where I kind of really got on this path, I guess, yeah. And so did you always know that you wanted to write? That's a funny question. I was actually thinking about that the other day because people talk about those moments where you suddenly realise what you want to do. And I think I had one pretty young. I was probably, I don't know, I think maybe still in primary school or just just started high school. And I was reading something and I just had this, it's not like a realisation, it's just like knowledge. You just know. And I just knew I was going to be a writer. And then my next thought was, oh, shit. (laughs) 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 Because I thought writing it's going to be so hard. It's so boring. I have to sit here and write these words. But for some reason, I just knew that's what it was going to be. And then I spent 10 years trying not to be a writer. (laughs) And it was funny because after I got back from Nepal, I studied filmmaking. And it was when I was, we all directed our own films and things like that. And I really loved the writing side, the script writing and the character development. And it was when I was directing a scene and I was screaming at everyone because we were, we were filming under a high school, which used to be a tip. Everyone was getting really sick and having to vomit between takes and the lighting was making everyone sick. And I, just, I was just losing it. And I, and I realized then that I had no place leading anyone. <laughs> You're like, this is not I know. for me. And, and being, being locked up in a room with no one around me. It was. And every now and again, my partner says to me, you're not really used to teamwork, are you? <laughs> and I am, but like through email, not, not, not directly. Um, and then I became a yoga teacher. So there you go. <laughs> and yoga teacher is really interesting because it is a group activity. But... I know. But at the same time, you're 
No one can interrupt me, so I find that fine. No, I'm just kidding. No, um, that's a great benefit of teaching <laughs> yoga. Well, actually, one interestingly, and I wonder if this is a really common thing with yoga teaching, one of the hardest things I found about teaching when I started was the lack of feedback from students. So in a conversation or something like that, you look, you get those verbal cues that people are understanding. And when I was teaching, you get that angry face if they're in a pose that's really hard or they're just really internal and when I'm in classes, I'm not really giving the teacher much because I'm in my own kind of experience. But it took me a while to not take it personally that there isn't always that feedback and that there are other ways of gauging if people are with you or not. So, yeah, that was a, that was a big lesson I had to, to do when I started teaching. It is interesting, isn't it? I'm sorry, I'm just going to... No, jump on in, Ryan. On there. Like, you can teach a class and at the end you can think, oh, that went really badly or something then someone will come to you and say oh my god that was was amazing amazing." I remember I'd just given blood actually it's in the book and I thought and I I have low blood blood pressure so when I give blood I get quite lightheaded and I turned up to teach a lunchtime office class and I just thought I have no idea how I'm going to get through this so I just did my praying for guidance kind of thing and at the end of the class, someone came and said, that was the best class you've ever taught. And I thought, all I need to do is drain myself of, uh-huh. you know, <laughs> I'll blood and I'll be fine. I feel like though, quite often that happens. It's like, I don't know, it takes you out of your everyday mind or something. So it is a more transcendent experience teaching. And like, sometimes that's when the magic really happens. And isn't that beautiful? Because I remember one of my classes, one of my teachers said, Claire Fleming, who you would have had, yeah, she said the yoga doesn't just work for the students, the yoga works for you as a teacher as well. And that was a really nice way of thinking, oh, it's not just me being great and teaching the students, it's actually just channeling something that's been around for hundreds of years and I'm part of that as well, yeah. And you mentioned you actually you actually started yoga back in Williamstown how did that come about oh well let's see how should I put it when I I, it started when I was about 17 so I grew up in the 90s the grunge era when look there wasn't much study going on there was a lot of pot smoking (laughs) and I was doing a lot of that and I was starting to have panic attacks and not knowing that they were panic attacks and there was a local yoga studio and I think I'd heard, oh, it's good for that kind of thing. And yoga really wasn't as much of a thing at all as it was, as it is now. This was 20 years ago. And so I kind of toddled along and my teacher just said to me, she she looked at me and she just said, you should really stop doing drugs. And I don't do drugs. And she just looked at me and just said, it's not good for you. And she was right. I have a kind of vata, very highly strung kind of energy. And so drugs just kind of send me off. And so I guess I kind of replaced pot with yoga a little bit, but it didn't really take off for me until I did my first Iyengar yoga class. And it was the most hideous experience ever. I remember, because you know, Iyengar teachers are really big into adjustments and they put me into trikonasana and I'd never done a trikonasana before. And it was like, I can't describe, it was like pain shooting through my body, but not bad pain, like good pain and... And it was, there was something really addictive about that intensity of Iyengar yoga. And I was in my early 20s then, so I think when you're young, that intensity is quite attractive. Now, I just, I don't want it. Yeah, so that, that led me eventually to want to become a teacher. And at the time, there really wasn't the kind of explosion of teacher training programs that there are now. And so I thought I had to be an Iyengar teacher because that's kind of what I did. And so, look, I went to a few kind of information sessions about the training and nobody smiled <gasps> and everyone was really kind of – and, look, this was my feeling at the time. I'm sure it maybe wasn't like that, but it felt like everyone was really severe and kind of calm and I was not calm and I was not the image of what I saw those teachers being. And so I just left it. I thought, this isn't – I can't do this. And I left it for 10 years. Yeah. Sort of been my experience of Iyengar yeah. as well. Not to cast any scorn upon Iyengar people, but yes. It is quite precise, put it mm-hmm. that way. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's very serious. Yeah. <laughs> but we love you if you do Iyengar. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but please smile a bit more. <laughs> so 
what led to you making the self-described ultimate white girl life change <laughs> and signing up to become a yoga teacher? Like what cycled you back 10 years later? A nervous breakdown. No, it wasn't a nervous breakdown. But I, I do wonder if that is what leads a lot of people to, particularly if it's a career change, it's something's not going right and you think. And I had just gotten a job in TV, which is a job that I'd been trying for for years and years. I'd started off um, doing feature film writing and that didn't really go anywhere. And so the next best thing I thought was TV and the culture of the TV show I found to be absolutely toxic and it was I don't know if I mean I'm sure this is actually a common feeling that you get to where you want in your career or where you thought you wanted to be and it's just horrendous and you don't feel like you've got a way out because you think how can I let down how can I let myself down I've worked so hard for this how can I bow out and then I thought oh my god there must be something wrong with me and it got so bad I was self-sabotaging that's when I really noticed the eating so bad yogi is about teacher training and uh, dealing with an eating disorder and that's when I really noticed those food behaviors really amping up and it was just getting like my body was making it harder and harder for me to deny that things weren't going well and I remember one night I just I was lying in bed and I just wanted to die it was one of those things of I don't really want to go through the pain of doing it, but I just want to not exist anymore. And it was when I was, I think it was one of those moments when you you finally crack and you think I've got nothing to lose. What else is there? Come on. If there's God, if there's anything, can you tell me now what it is I'm supposed to be doing because this isn't working? And that's when I, it sounds so wanky to say it verbally, but that's when I kind of felt this sense in myself or the voice or whatever it was just saying, if you want something to change, you've got to be willing to give up everything. And I thought, yeah, why not? <laughs> and I'd sort of heard that whispering before, but I I had so many attachments to the career or to this or to that. I wasn't willing to give those things up. And so very quickly, I mean, it wasn't immediate, but I started researching different areas to go into. And I happened upon the yoga teacher training course when I was looking for cheap massages. <laughs> And I tried a few different training sort of types, which I talk about. One of them was Bikram yoga, which didn't go well. And then hit upon the training that I did, which I guess what Joe, you did it. Would you I call did. it classical yoga? It was it was not aligned with one particular style. Described it as contemporary classical yoga. Yeah, so it, the, all the teachers have different styles, but they're teaching you the fundamentals of meditation, pranayama, asana, but not this is the Ashtanga way or the Iyengar way, which was great because you get to play around and and find your own way of teaching, and then. The thing about yoga, I realized, is that very quickly, if you do it quite intensely, it clears away all the veils that between you and what's kind of working or not working, which was really ugly. I didn't, I didn't want it to do that. I, I thought being a yoga teacher, I think my image of it was, I'll just become spiritual. I'll be a teacher. I'll never have to suffer again because I'll be happy all the time. And instead, it just actually took me deeper into what wasn't working, which I now realize was essential and what was meant to happen. And because I had yoga, it was kind of a container for that. So even though things were coming up, I had practices to deal with it. And that's when ugh, I realized I had an eating disorder and had to go and deal with that. And it was a wonderful time to realize something like that because I was in this two-year teacher training course and everything I was going through was really held within that training, which was just miraculous, I think. And I think it's one of those things that when we're often learning about these yogic practices, it's almost in this abstract way of like, oh, these are the tools to help you navigate the storms of life. Mm. And if you just calm on your mat, you're like, oh, yep. But when you're actually in the midst of one of those really intense times, it's like, oh, yeah, that's what these practices are for. Absolutely. And and I still do pra practice yoga and think, if I just practice enough, I'll never have to stop. <laughs> and of course, it's not true. And I remember two things. One, at the information session, it was a two-year training course. And they said, look, the first year is really just about you applying these practices to yourself. It's about you understanding what it means in your own life. The second year is when we teach you to teach other people. You cannot teach until you've done that work on yourself, as attractive as it would be. <laughs> and the other thing is I remember 
that first year of philosophy is quite intense. Lee Blaschke is one hell of a teacher in that department. And it was great. It was really thorough, but it's very heady as well. And I remember Heather, Lee's wife, was my mentor. And I was saying, oh, you know, my dad was sick. He was in hospital. And I was saying, I just can't get it, my head around the this and the that. And she said, oh, just screw it. If you can sit with your dad who's dying and, and not try and change his experience and really be present in your own experience, that's kind of yoga philosophy. And it really shifted my idea to being something that you studied and achieved to something that you took a little bit of and really started to un understand your own life. And Lee actually just quickly again, he was he was fantastic in that every time we'd have a session on the sutras, he'd say, you're not meant to read the sutras like a book, obviously. You're meant to take one or two at a time, really work with it in your life and, and life will show you what this, that sutra means and then move on to the next. You might work with two a year and that's, that's fantastic. Yeah. yeah, it's interesting. I actually, sort of a side note, but I went to a training with Leslie Kamenoff recently oh, I love and he and yeah it was, it was amazing and he was talking about krishnamacharya going through the sutras with desikacha and through the course of their life they actually went through all of the sutras in total like three or four times and and each time they went into it a little bit more in depth so i don't know complete side note but i, I thought that was completely interesting well he wrote did was it desikacha wrote the heart of yoga or yeah. and with so. that beautiful explanation of the sutra was just so accessible mm, and mm. so if anyone was going to teach you that would be wonderful <laughs> mm, mm. and just to get that in-depth exploration and each time going and also like krishnamacharya of all people yeah. he's like i still need four goes at this <laughs> yeah. probably could do round five as well absolutely and so I guess that leads us to some of those interesting parallels that you write about in your book between going through a 12-step program and a yoga teacher training at the same time. Mm, mm. I mean, that was friggin' intense, let me tell you. Like, I, don't, I wasn't working much in the first year, so that was actually pretty good because I could kind of dive in. I didn't have kids. I don't know how I would dive in if I had kids when you've got to pretend that you've got it together. Um, and so I could really let myself kind of explore both and the parallel it was interesting I found a lot of parallels and probably one of the main ones is that it gets worse before it gets better and both 12 step and yoga are really about systematically stripping back beliefs veils all that kind of stuff which is hard hard work which is why I always laugh at the contemporary imagery of yoga which is always about serenity and for me Yoga is eventually about serenity, but first it's about hideous anger and blood and sweat, that kind of stuff, and those storms and fires. But both yoga and 12 step are equally about it's not meant to be like this self flagellating, kind of masochistic stepping back. So they both really have this sense of, I mean, easy does it is one of the 12 step slogans, this sense of, of not kind of torturing yourself a little bit of it at a time. And one of my favorite quotes, because I was really diving in heavily and it was it was so hard. And also because dad was in hospital, I was already in that really raw headspace. And in a way that was kind of good because you can kind of get somewhere and really fast forward, but it can be too much sometimes. And there was a quote in the Donna Fari book, which I loved, which is, Something like yoga practice can be a little bit like weeding a hillside, but if you weed too much, you realize that the weeds were actually stabilizing the hill and that it can actually be destabilizing. And that taught me to go a bit more gently and you need to have a bit of fun, you know. <laughs> and yoga and 12 step are not anti-fun, but I became quite pious about it. And I think the main parallel that I see between them I mean, one, they, they are systematic. There's a first you do this, then you do this. Yoga can be very self-guided because classes aren't first. But the 12 step is definitely you do one step at a time, you have a sponsor. But for me, the key, the fundamental thing where they mix is that they're both about getting you to have a relationship with a power greater than yourself. And 12 step calls it a power greater than yourself or God. Yoga, there is like 700 words, <laughs> <laughs> universal consciousness, Brahman, Purusha, you know, all those sorts of things. 
or Ishvara Pranidhan was the Niyama was where it first came to me, which is now what what is that again? It's like that surrender to, surrender the, divine. to the divine. Yeah. So I had to it was a real job for me to work out what that was for me. And one, it was essential to recovery because the second step is that that's you have to kind of get there. But I was brought up an atheist, so that was a real process for me. And I can't, and I talk about it in Bad Yogi about how does an atheist find God, essentially. And I'm quite a logical person, so it's quite pros, cons, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And so, if it's something you can put into words, like what conclusion did you get to with all of this? Well, well, it changes every day, but I think. I'll try and keep it really simple. I did get caught up in a lot of the terminology, you know, what do I call it? Now I call it God just because it's simple and other people, but I know a lot of people have a reaction to that because they have a churchy idea of God and you got to call it something. But really it's just my inner wisdom. But I really, and I'm sorry, Lee Blaschke, if you're listening to this and I'm getting this wrong, but I was reading up on yoga philosophy and I liked that idea that, and I, and I know I'm going to get this wrong, so it's teachers, I'm sorry, but it felt like the Atman is the, the soul and the Brahman is like the universal consciousness or something. So that there is a universal God or a universal consciousness and I'm a little bit of that. And so I can trust my inner wisdom and if I fail, that fails me, I can trust my outer wisdom. And I know that, I look, I could talk about it all day about what it means, but I think ultimately it's just really about finding that sense of truth within yourself and knowing that there's like a bigger truth out there that you can connect to when you feel a bit lost. And however you experience that, it's more of an experience than a language. And I, for better or worse, I, I tend to experience that in the park when I go walking and I'm in the trees and all that sort of thing, particularly early morning. And it was this is my favorite story about finding God because Andrew, who is Jorge in the book, he is a Tantra teacher and he said, look, we all know, think Tantra is about sex and all this kind of stuff, but really it's about seeing the divine in all. And if you can see the divine in all, I mean, that's God. And I thought, oh, that's a nice idea. Yeah, I can see the divine in all and yeah, I'm spiritual now and stuff. <laughs> and I remember a few mornings later, it was really early morning and I was walking through the Carlton Gardens and there's this beautiful avenue of trees where they kind of make this canopy and there's this fountain at the end and I was walking through the canopy of trees and I could see like the light coming through the fountain. It was like God was speaking to me. I'm like, oh yeah, I really got this. And then when I got closer to the fountain, my eyes tracked down and I saw this man holding his penis and looking at me, but not like in a sexy way, like in a really sad way. <laughs> not that there is a sexy way. To look at <laughs> and he was just like, he had these, I remember he had these like dirty gray tracksuit bars. <laughs> and there was just something so sad about it. And I mean, at first, my first instinct was shock, but very quickly I realized it's daylight, there's joggers. I, I realized I wasn't in any danger. And then I just suddenly Andrew's words popped in. Like, because <laughs> I've been in this moment where like I'm in this divine moment and if, if, if I can see God in the fountain, here's this man, God is surely in that man just as much as in these trees. And, you know, talk about yoga being living the philosophy. If you were ever asked, do you are you really walking the walk? Can you see the divine in a man flashing you in dirty tracks? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, and I stood there in my face. I must have been having giving this really weird smile because he, <laughs> he looked so frightened. All of a sudden, he pulled up his pants and ran away. I'm like, man, what a cosmic antidote I to know, a like sex I predator. Know, <laughs> like, I know. And I and I looked at him running away, and I just I just like prayed for him. I thought, oh, what what a sad thing to like want to do that and I don't think it was the reaction he was wanting <laughs> but whenever I feel like oh, I'm the worst person in the world or I hate that person I remember that moment it's like man if you can see the divine in him you can surely see it in yourself and these other people yeah it's weird what a great lesson yeah <laughs> absolutely I, just, I, I don't know I, I guess there's there's, there's something divine in the sort of sadness, the humour, the just... But the timing, right? Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. always those moments when you think you've got it and then the universe will come and say, if you think you've got it, well, how about this? Yeah. And you're like, yeah. oh, okay, now I get it. Yeah, yeah. 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 Absolutely. Or it's like, it's like the penny keeps dropping. Like you think you've figured it out. You're like, oh, there's a whole other layer here that I wasn't I even aware of. But having said that, I think I'm done with flashes. <laughs> oh, yeah, learnt that cosmic lesson. I don't think I need to see that anymore. <laughs> no, no, keep it in your pants. Yeah. <laughs> so 
Sorry, just in case anyone listening was thinking of <laughs> <laughs> spreading some divine wisdom out in the park yeah, in the early morning. Like, you know, isn't it the Zen teachers would would get their students into meditation and go and whack them on the back with a cane or mm. something? I don't know much about Zen, but so I think the that... cane is people falling asleep. Oh, I thought yeah. it was about like there's a crazy wisdom tradition yeah. as well. I think where teachers just do shocking, shocking things, things to yeah, like yeah. shake people out of their yeah. Everyday malaise. I'm imagining that's like a, a really good excuse for like a male sex predator teacher's kind of thing. I was just like trying mm. to shock you out of your. Mm. <laughs> oh, there's a lot of crossover. Yeah, yeah I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. no, yeah. It's, it's kind of the beat poet era. Oh like, God, yeah, don't no. get me started. Yeah. Mm. So you've already mentioned a few of the teachers on the teacher training, and I definitely recognised some familiar characters in the book because I did the same course. And you changed their names and changed a few little details. Did you have any internal dilemmas about how much to leave and how much to change? Oh, my God. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I would say this for any writers, particularly memoir writers. It's 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 the number one thing, I think, is, is how do you write about real people? And I tortured myself for a lot. And I think in the end, you just have to go for it. You just have to really go warts and all and then edit. It's much easier to edit once you've written than it is to feel like you've got chains around your hands while you're trying to write. And so I just went for it. And then afterwards I changed the names and I looked at times when I'd been a little bit snarky and I, you really have to ask what the point of the story is. Is it in service to the story? Is it making a point about me? Am I just having a go at them? And often my observations about the teachers, I tried to to make it that it was really about me and my headspace that I was pre- – and so when I saw Andrew, I just really reacted against him because he was so free and crazy and and I wasn't. And so I, that was a judgment I had on him and so I was writing sort of that description of him in that way, but it was absolutely about me. So I changed the names. A couple of the teachers, I gave it to them to just sort of – say this is what's coming did you give it to andrew i offered him and he said no and he ended up i think being really happy with it so that's good and i think people took it in the spirit that it was intended but i definitely think if you are writing don't get ahead of yourself thinking about how is it going to be received you just have to go for it think about that later yeah and like another layer beyond the teachers was also you wrote some really personal stuff about your family as oh well. God, so like gosh. I imagine that would have been like really hard to speak your truth and get all of this out. Oh and it was God. such an important part of the story. Joe, I just went through months of insomnia before it came out, just before publication. And it was so hard not to snatch the manuscript back and just delete everything. So I offered it to my parents to read before publication and they said no, which was really great of them. And they basically said, you know, it's your story. It's, I think there was an understanding that it's, it's my perspective. It's not like the truth, truth, that there is no one truth. And that's why I had that at the start of Bad Yogis, there's, there's that quote from David Sedaris, which is memoirs, the last place I'd go looking for truth because it's, it is so my experience. And it was interesting because, I mean, it was terrifying, but one of the things that people have said about it is, oh, you really went there and were vulnerable and things. And and I, I, it was really hard to write. And I was thinking you have to have that reason for writing it. And it was if you can help someone else. And I think that you have to be honest. It's that there's that universal thing in the personal. And if you strip all the detail and nuance out of your own story, it becomes meaningless. And I was talking to my editor about it because there's a lot of references to my grandfather who was a painter and the legacy that he had on the family. And she said, oh, look, and I said, oh, look, should I take it out? Is it not relevant? And she said, look, I think it's a really fundamental thing, that pa- strong patriarchal figure that influences a whole family and can that dysfunction can kind of travel. And so I kind of kept things in which were painful, which I thought were kind of archetypal. And there were definitely scenes which I combined or ways in which I might disguise a character or there was look there was a lot of things that didn't get in the book because they were just really full on and I thought it's not necessary to put that in there. But it is, I'm not going to lie, it is excruciating writing a memoir about when your family's concerned because you live with them, you see them, yeah. And you're writing your innermost thoughts about them, the things that you wouldn't say. Again, yeah. And again, I tried to make it 
about me and the headspace I was in. And it's so funny because a friend of mine is an older guy and he's got an adult daughter and he said, oh, she's writing this memoir and she's like saying how awful we are and like it's really her truth and she's going to try and publish it and tell everyone how mean we were to her and things. And I thought, yeah, I really get that because when I started to write, it was like, yeah, I'm I'm great and everyone else is bad. And they're... But then fortunately, and I do think it's some cosmic intervention that really shifted and I and I was thinking about what is the value of telling a story. It's not to drop people in it. Everyone's got their own path. And I talk about that in the book in that there's a, a period, one of the steps I mean, 12 step is about taking an inventory of your resentments and things like that. And a lot of stuff came up about my family then. And my friend, and it, I'm, I'm waffling, so really give me a wrap up if. if oh, gosh, if no, not at all. This is really interesting. Yeah. But I've actually noticed this is quite common in yoga, people who really dive into yoga as well, that you can get a lot of resentment about things about upbringing and the way that you took on certain beliefs and things like that. And I was talking to my friend. Kate, who is in the book, who went through rehab for heroin addiction. And one of the things that they did in rehab was that they taught people about family dynamics and how certain dynamics can lead to addiction, for example. And she said, we were all so resentful. They watched this documentary about it and everyone was so wiped out after the documentary, hating their families. They had to bring in counsellors to kind of, to, to kind of say to everyone, look, your family aren't bad people everyone's doing the best that they can and that's that that is all that they can do and when i had children a couple of years ago it was shocking how much i understood about my own parents because i realized you were so limited by your own capacity to love to forgive and we're all pretty limited in in certain ways of course we're going to pass things on to our children and i'm waiting for the reckoning which my son's three and I'm already feeling like I'm having the reckoning, <laughs> that you, forgiveness, you can't, you can be angry, but you can't stay there. And I remember Kate saying to me, like, you've been complaining about this for a really long time. Maybe it's time to move on. And that's, that's really when yoga and 12 step helped me transcend that and come out the other side. And I think that it's a really important thing when you are doing yoga and, and 12 step to have a teacher or to have people bring you through those periods because sure it's important to understand where you came from but it's really important to forgive and take responsibility for your own life and kind of move on as well. Yeah it's kind of like here are the cards I was dealt how do I want to play them? Yes exactly exactly and and it's much it's liberating it's it's liberating for other people as well and yeah anyway. Hello, Ran here to talk about our Patreon page. Patreon is a way that you can help support the podcast for as little as $1 a month. Higher tiers get access to extra special content, as well as a listing on our website and a shout out on the podcast. We also offer some extra content, including a chat Joe and I recently had, where we talked about our last episode with Cora, some of the work we've been doing mentoring other teachers to get their offerings online, and how we found the experience of moving back to in-person classes, even for that short time. If you'd like to support us as well, please go to patreon.com slash flow artist podcast and join the Patreon club. If you'd like to support us in other ways, you can share this episode on social media, subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, or just reach out and let us know your thoughts on this or anything else. All right, let's get back to our conversation with Alice Williams. So just hearing you speak about all of this now, it almost feels like the book itself was both a continuation of your yoga teacher training and your journey to recovery. Did it feel like that writing it at the time? Was it just like a natural progression of both of those parts? Oh, absolutely. And I think to get to a point where I could articulate things, it was a lot of mental and emotional work, not just sitting down at the computer, but noticing something would come up and I wouldn't be able to write. And I, you, I mean, this is a, a fundamental teaching of yoga is get curious. If you notice something up, get curious. So as every day when I'd notice that I was really blocked, okay, get curious what's going on here. And it would be something shameful I didn't want to write about myself or a resentment I didn't know that I'd had that I knew I was putting in the book to get revenge on someone. And so I was really conscious of working through that. Hopefully I did before I actually put it out into the world. 
And I remember doing an interview about it and they were talking about vulnerability and how does it feel to be vulnerable in a book and things. And I, I don't feel vulnerable talking about it because I've done the work around it. And if you still feel vulnerable about something, I would argue that you don't, you're not really perhaps ready to put it out there in a public space. So I'm writing something at the moment which I still feel really vulnerable about. And I know that it's not ready to go out. I just have to to work with it. So I think, yeah, writing for me is very, oh God, I never thought I'd say this. It's a bit of a spiritual practice. (laughs) I don't know why I feel wanky saying that, but it is. (laughs) What you're just saying as well, it's actually something I've read about as a principle of trauma-informed teaching, like to teach from the scars and not the wounds. Hmm. So you can share. That's interesting. Yeah, you can share the stuff from your life and how you've got through it, but don't share the raw stuff. Don't mm. share the stuff that you're still healing and still working with because it's too raw to unleash on other people when they've Absolutely. got their own stuff going and on. And do you find when you're teaching sometimes you go there and you're like, oh, I've got to steer away from that because I'm not through it yet or...? I actually had, I did have that experience. I was, most of our listeners know that Ryan had stomach cancer a few years ago and we thought it was terminal for a little while. And just, I only told a few of my students that all of that stuff was going on because I actually found that just going to teach and having that different perspective for that hour and like Mm. being present with other people um, was exactly what I needed at that time. Because, you know, there's a lot of talk about authenticity and honesty as a teacher, but it would not have served me to like break my heart open every class and share from that place because I needed that time where I wasn't in the depths of all of that emotional intensity. And it was actually really helpful to help me navigate through the rest of the life stuff that we had going on. And I guess like we do share about, we always talk about that stuff and we talk about it on the podcast, but I'm also aware of we don't know what people are bringing to their practice Mm, and we mm. don't want to emotionally burden people Mm. who are coming to yoga as their own respite from the burdens that they might be carrying in the rest of their life. Because if they're worried about you. Exactly. It's pulling them out of their own practice. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny because I don't know. I wonder if you both found this when you were doing your training. I remember there was a point in training where we were all pretty raw, raw you know, we were really getting into it. And, and when we'd say, how are you? We'd be like, oh, yeah, no, this stuff's just coming up and I'm just really. <laughs> and and it was that kind of discovering what authenticity means. And sometimes you'd go a little bit too far. You'd overshare because this is this new thing, authenticity, and it feels great. Let's have no shame about things. But then as you go along, you realize actually that it's good to have a few little boundaries in place. And Brene Brown is fantastic about sharing with people who have earned the right to hear, I guess. It's also good to make it not all about you yes. in the class to give people some space to have yeah. their own experience. That said, me and Ron both told the same story in our classes this morning. Our cat has just got this obsession with gluten-free bread. <laughs> He like stole a piece of gluten-free garlic bread off Ryan's plate the other night. And then this morning I heard this like scrunchy noise and he got on the table and like grabbed this packet of rolls and like torn into it and like opened up the bag and there's like little kitty teeth marks <laughs> and there's expensive gluten-free rolls. Oh. And we both felt the need to share that story this morning. These are our wounds. It's yeah. probably not making you feel very vulnerable to share <laughs> That's gorgeous. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we go deep. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Why not? I I am sort of curious though, was there a particular moment that you decided you had to write the book or Yeah. It's funny because when we were doing when we were doing the teacher training, we had to keep two journals, so a philosophy j- journal and an Asana journal. And I know that I was really just writing the truth. But I tended to write it in little scenes. This happened and they said this and I did that. And that's often how I think in scenes, I guess. And later on, it struck me that some of it was kind of funny and it was very different to the yoga stuff I was reading, which was quite serious. And and I thought, geez, wouldn't it be great if like someone wrote something that could like show you the funny side of it as well so it's not all this heavy? And then I thought, hell I'll just write it <laughs> <That's a body. laughs> yeah. Yeah. oh and I also I thought I don't want to go through all this suffering and not turn it into something <laughs> this is some good material and so I guess that leads us to this idea of yogic perfection 
and perfectionism and like this shadow within the yoga community, which is definitely one of the themes that you address in Bad Yogi. It's kind of inherent in the title, really. Oh, maybe I'll just make that my question. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Like, is there anything you'd like to share around that? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, my God. I mean, where do you start? I remember there was this fantastic Jung, Jung quote, which if I get it wrong, someone tell me. And it was something like, we don't become enlightened by imagining enlightened beings. We become enlightened by, by making the darkness conscious. And I remember Andrew's teaching, the Tantra teachings were very much about transforming that darkness. And I... Look, I, a lot of it's intuitive. I would often find myself in yoga environments and look, it was no one's fault suddenly and maybe I was imagining it, but you know you sometimes you're in a class or a retreat and it feels like there's this group think or group feeling that goes on and sometimes it's wonderful like it's when you're really gelling and the philosophy is coming through and everyone's really getting it. And other times I would find I'd be in places and it would feel quite oppressive. It's quite perfectionist and no one wants to get it wrong. And I've been in workshops with quite esteemed teachers and that's definitely been there. And I've been quite surprised because I, I guess I put some teachers on a pedestal and I thought surely they wouldn't be encouraging this kind of perfection. And yet they were some of the most stifling environments I was in and I remember doing this retreat and it was all women and I don't know if it was I don't know if it's unique to environments where there's lots of women or what at any one gender like I think single gendered environments can have good and bad kind of qualities but everyone was just being so good capital G good and we're all grateful and bowing to each other all the time and oh this is so wonderful and this is so wonderful and even on the coffee break it was like oh no I just like and and it just felt like there was, you weren't allowed to show personality. You couldn't say, oh, you know, I'm really struggling with this that came up. And I, what do you think this means? And everything was just gratitude, gratitude. And I remember I went with my friend and we were driving home and we were just speeding down the highway, swearing. And she was, this is Kate, who is a sex worker. And she was telling me all her dirty sex worker stories. <laughs> and, and it was kind of like just this unleashing of repressed energy. And I know for myself, I can be quite a perfectionistic, like go hard or go home kind of person. And so I guess it's taught me to tap into my intuition about, am I really getting like holding this too tightly? Because if I am, and I've certainly had classes, particularly when I was teach, beginning teaching, where I really knew that I was having this controlling energy on the students as well and bringing kind of fear into the class, which is my own fear about not being a good enough teacher. And so I, I think for myself, I've realized that I have to get familiar with my own shadow and forgive it. And I often do that in meditation where I'll notice that I'm feeling really the base feelings we all have, envy, desire, whatever it is. And I just have to go, oh, yeah, that's okay to have that. It's okay. And I remember a teacher said to me once, and it was liberating, if people knew what we really thought, we'd be locked up. And I was like, oh, thank God. <laughs> it's not just in my head. I know. I've had, I've had 10 illegal thoughts this morning. <laughs> and that's wonderful. We have, it's so liberating to accept those sides of yourself. And I really talk about it in the book. It was shocking to go, and I won't name it, but shocking experience to go to an ashram in Melbourne and they have the ashram all around Australia and the world. And there was this really fear-driven, I felt, atmosphere and we very heavy on you weren't allowed to wear leggings, you weren't allowed to wear fitted clothes because that might incite lust. You had to do this, do that, don't do this. And there were these senior teachers who kind of would walk around and like police you. <laughs> and I remember just thinking, oh, and, you know, at the end we'd, we'd chant for hours about divine this and joy that. Mean, meanwhile, it was a very joyless atmosphere. And then later on I was doing research about sexual abuse within the yoga community for an article and came upon all these transcripts from the child, what are they called, the Royal Commission on Child Sexual Abuse, and they mentioned this particular ashram and the leader of the ashram had been abusing underage people and what was most disturbing to me was that his senior female teacher had been assisting him and everyone in the ashram at the time, probably, well, not everyone, but most people probably had a pretty good idea of what was going on. And I get chills thinking about it now because the woman who was leading the ashram, and I think she's probably still there, she said in the court documents, yeah, but those women, those girls could be pretty flirtatious. And I just 
my blood runs cold thinking that this the abuse happened, I think, 20 years ago, but people who enabled it are still there and those attitudes are still there. And I think if you don't acknowledge the shadow, I mean, sure, it's nice to say, oh, yeah, we've got to do it. But if you're in one of those particularly yoga communities where they're quite closed, living environment, if the group doesn't acknowledge the group shadow, then abuse can flourish. And it happened in that, I think the Shiva, oh, I don't want to name the wrong one, but there was another one in Melbourne that it happened. And and the effect on the people, I mean, you read about people who've gone through abuse in the Catholic Church and they talk about when faith and abuse are mixed, the thing that you really relied on you to get through tough times is tainted. And one of the survivors I talked to for the article said, we held this teacher up in high esteem and when he's been in charge of your awakening, suddenly that awakening itself seems false. And one of the students said, we were taught, this is one of the transcripts, she said that there was this idea that the higher up the person who abused you was, and I'm getting a bit dark, I'm sorry, but the closer to awakening that you were. And I, it's horrific because I think we can talk about these things as if they're in the past. Oh, yeah, we know about these things. That would never happen. But I think the thing about that kind of abusive power is it's so subtle and it happens by degrees, little bit by little bit. It's not just someone corners you in an alley. And we look at the stuff with Bikram yoga and read about it and you think, how could that happen? But it's that group mentality. And I think I know from my own experience in teacher training, and I kind of take the piss out of it in the book, but even in our class of students, there was this feeling of, oh, if we're not getting it, there's not something wrong with us. And we're not trying hard enough. We're not yogic enough. And that's partly why I called it bad yogi. This idea that we're not yogic enough is is toxic. And and yogic enough is accepting that we're total bags of neurotic whatever. And that's okay. <laughs> that's fine. Yeah, that's yeah. human. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's really interesting. I mean, I had a workshop experience recently. I won't go too in depth on it. I had a bit of a rant on Facebook about it though. I'm going to look that up. (laughs) (laughs) But just the the group dynamics, like you said, it just sort of, there was one person that seemed a little bit outside from the group to begin with. And towards the end, he sort of made certain comments about a different, I guess, guru. And this person was quite forcefully and furiously rejected from the group. And that in itself, I, I don't think there was probably any other way that that could have happened. But it Just because he was being really disruptive. Yeah, yeah. But it, it just sort of, it, I found it quite scary how the group just sort mm. of. The idea that you're not allowed to say that? Or, or this isn't the right place to say that. Oh, oh um, okay. Yeah. We all paid lots of money to be here. This isn't what we paid for. Oh, right. It's inconvenient. Yeah, 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 yeah essentially. Yeah. And, and yeah, just how that group unified against this person was mm. quite interesting. And I, I don't know, I feel like in certain context within the, the so-called spiritual community, the even just the language we use can lead us towards this destination, which is not very... <laughs> In what way? Like what language? I guess when we say things like, like you mentioned before, that, you know, we should... Or I guess anything saying we should be arriving at a particular destination, mm, um, I think, sets up things for... <laughs> well, that's interesting because I guess it's also about responsibility. And I think about someone like Marion Williamson, who's in the kind of spiritual world and she talks a lot about if you become a yoga teacher or if you go into spiritual stuff somehow you can't have that spiritual bypass where you abdicate yourself from responsibility for the world you still have to speak up you still have to do what's right it's not just looking at yourself and you're oh that's just my issue you do have to speak up and that actually leads me to a question I was just about to ask because we've all identified this issue and this dynamic in different places that we've been in where to from here? Like, what do you do when you kind of sense that current in the room and that feeling of group mentality and maybe it not feeling right for you? Yeah, look, I think I'm a big advocate of the middle way, so not demonizing any one particular group. I don't think we... And well, that's I'm, just a different type of group mentality, really. Yeah, look, and I'm in a, 
writers group on Facebook, it's women writers, and it can get quite heated in there about you're not allowed to say this word or that word. You're not allowed to say, hey, guys, because that's, you know. <laughs> that's too gendered. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And look, I, I understand, but I think we can miss the bigger picture a little bit. And so I think when you're in situations where there is that group fit, think, one, you have to think, is this actually worth saying? Is it kind of, and if it is, I think it's coming at it from a, not a position of opposition, but we've all got the same goal and maybe this idea is impinging that goal. So not coming at it from you, da, 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 da. Mm. there's enough polarization as it is, but you still have to be direct. And one of the things I've noticed in the yoga world is it well, not no, I'm, I'm being kind of generalizing, but there can be a tendency to hedge your bets and you don't want to really say something too strongly. There's that wishy-washiness. And I think, no, that's never what it's about. It's about really tapping into that fire. And Pema Chodron, the Buddhist nun, she says, it's not about becoming this personality blob. It's about bracing the spice and the fire and and but taking responsibility yeah I hope that answers the question yeah no no I think that's a really good perspective as well because in the trauma informed training I was just in there was a little discussion about owning what we feel and using I statements and not being kind of like we statements about like oh yeah this thing happens in society but actually being like I feel like this or I feel like something just happened here and Mm. maybe we should all have a bit of a look at that because I think no one can argue with you about how you feel. Mm, mm. So, and that's exactly what you're saying, like that being authentic and speaking up but not speaking for anyone but yourself maybe in that that situation. And I think the other thing that I, and I'm, I'm noticing myself hedging my bets about how to say this, but I think that those I statements, I think they're great. And we can also slip into I'm offended or I'm hurt, therefore you've done something wrong, Mm. that that sense of that victim place. And even though it is important to own your truth, it's about owning it and not holding others responsible. Like it's your job to say how you feel, but it's not anyone else's job to fix that. Does that make sense? Yeah, Yeah, definitely. And I guess as well. It's not your job to say how you feel every second sentence. I know. <laughs> Maybe pick your battles. <laughs> yeah, <I know. laughs> oh, God, I had a friend like that once. Anyway. <laughs> we all have a friend like that. Sometimes I'm worried I am that person in a workshop. Are we all or a are, are. We all are. <laughs> That's why having a podcast is so good. <laughs> I t- t- write a memoir and then see how I feel. <laughs> so you write in bad yogi about your somewhat sarcastic tone that you often take in like your online yoga articles and you've kind of named it here how like that sardonic kind of sarcastic edge to your writing is something that comes really easily and it's funny and it's engaging and it is kind of poking fun at a sacred cow or two but do you think it's also a way of kind of masking a bit of vulnerability? Absolutely, absolutely and at first I wasn't aware of that And then the further I've gone on, the further I've seen it, it can be a shield. And it's usually when I'm reading something and my poor readers, I'm sure they've had it before I did. In fact, some of them have told me I'm a terrible writer because of it. But it's when I'm getting quite tired reading my writing and it's like, oh, I've really been hammering something. What am I, what am I trying to hide behind? And definitely humor can be a shield, but I didn't, this is going to sound a bit like I'm a child, not grown up, but I didn't realize that sarcasm was a hostile kind of form of humor until I had children. And then I realized that kids don't get sarcasm because they're not old enough yet to understand the nuance, but they get that there's hostility behind it. And that's when I just started to really pull back and think if I need to be sarcastic to make a point, what's going on and is there a better way? And not saying that you can't be funny, but if I'm relying on that to be funny, it's kind of lazy or there's, there's something there that I need to look at. So can I quote one of your articles? Oh, sure, go for it. <laughs> After a long week of telling people to breathe in and out, there's nothing better than lying on the couch to watch a jolly good beheading on Game of Thrones. <laughs> <laughs> and if the theme of the class is equanimity, chances are we're trying not to take it personally that only two people turned up to last night's class, ditto body love, patience, and forgiving those who wronged us. <laughs> And so that was from your article, Things That Your Yoga Teacher Is Dying To Tell You But Probably Won't. 
which I think is hilarious. Thank you. That was so funny when I wrote that because I didn't think it would do anything. It's just a quick, fun thing. And then it got republished on an American site and I think it went up to have a million hits. And I thought if I got paid by hits, that'd be great, but I didn't get paid anything. So that sucks. But what was really interesting about that was that it had a lot of comments afterwards from yoga teachers and it was really polarized between, oh my God, thank God someone's saying this and real anger, like you shouldn't be a yoga teacher and I don't think these things and blah, 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 blah. And that's when I started to think about the shadow side of yoga that when there was that real pushback about how dare you, you awful person, then I thought, oh, this is kind of fun. Let's, let's keep going here. Yeah, obviously I've like struck something <laughs> yeah, here. Definitely. <laughs> yeah. And so has your perspective on the yoga world changed much since you wrote Bad Yogi? Yeah, well, I think I'm probably moving in different yoga circles than I was, but one of the things that I've noticed – is that there seems to be a lot more focus on diversity and body positivity in yoga, which is brilliant. And at the same time, there's a whole lot more insta-yogi influences and that that side, it's always a skinny white girl on a beach in a backbend. That side is stronger than ever and I don't think it's going anywhere. But I think we're getting to be more critically informed about how to understand and deconstruct those images. And I think one of the things I'm actually really noticing as a student is, I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot more teacher trainings that are churning out teachers at a faster rate. The teachers are quite young. And I think it's brilliant that yoga is becoming more accessible to people. But at the same time, there are a lot of teachers out there who maybe don't have the life experience or, or who have that image of yoga. And I'm, re oh, it really frustrates me that I'll be in studio classes and there'll be a teacher who doesn't really look at the students, who's not looking and assessing the student's posture. One of my bugbears is adjustments. Like I love, I mean, I come from a younger, I love a good adjustment. It makes me feel cared about. It makes me feel like I'm progressing. And there's a real reluctance to put hands on a student. And I look, I understand there's stuff about consent. So find a way of getting consent. And, and if someone doesn't want it, don't do it. But the total hands-off approach, like I see people who've been in the same class for years and they're still doing this horrible, and when I say horrible, I mean like really unaligned, looks really horrible for their joints pose. And I want to go over there and say, look, just because, you know, over time it's going to lead to injury. And it feels like a lot of teachers aren't really seeing, seeing their students. They're just coming in, teaching the class, they've been taught to teach. And also I kind of mourn, and look, I sound really old and jaded, but they're just that thing of it, it's becoming an exercise class in that there's not a lot of bringing in of yoga philosophy, just a little quote here and there, it's all you need. And, and there's not that sense of we are doing this to draw inwards, to kind of feel good. It's just like, okay, do this pose, okay, do that pose. So that that's saddens me. But on the other hand, there's a lot more in the direction of understanding of yoga causing injury. There is a lot more awareness in that area. And yeah, I look, I think anything that encourages diversity is brilliant. I really do get tired of seeing studios having one body type in all their imagery, their advertising. Yeah, it's really frustrating. Especially when they position themselves as a body positive studio. There are a couple of studios in Melbourne who who they have teaching does not reflect what they say their philosophy is. And it's it's funny, I was on Instagram the other day and I saw a teacher that I used to have and she was on a cliff top doing a back bend <laughs> that most people can't do. And the quote was something like, respecting your body and its limitations and, oh. not, com and not comparing yourself. And I just thought, like, hats off to people who want to p put pictures of themselves on Instagram doing that stuff. Like there, there's no problem with that. But then if you're going to talk about not comparing yourself, of course people are going to look at that and, and think, oh, I couldn't do that. And of course people are going to look at that and think, not I should respect my body's limitations. So that kind of hypocrisy can can be a bit strong sometimes. I think just to cycle back to what you were saying about your experience in class as well, how it doesn't even have to be a hands-on physical adjustment. It can just be being present with that person and being mindful and teaching in a way that helps people find their own inner alignment and have that mindful awareness. And that can be your philosophy. Mm. It doesn't even have to be a sutra mm. or a quote, just mm. guiding people into a more rich inner experience and better understanding of themselves 
But Joe, I think to do that, you have to be able to do that yourself. And I've noticed, I noticed when I started teaching, I was often rushing from class to class and I was feeling not in my body and I had just got there five minutes before. And it, it, I mean, it should be in the job description of a yoga teacher that you have to take five minutes first to center yourself. And if we're not centered, and I include myself so much in this, I'm so oh, guilty of that. that was me this morning as yeah. well. I didn't have a very centered morning. <laughs> well, if we're not centered, how are we going to give that to students? But, yeah, that's not usually in the literal job description. Like that comes back to that perfectionism thing as well. Like we aren't all these perfect people who've set aside two no, hours of meditation every no. morning so we can teach yeah. from a pure place. Like, and hopefully it just comes through us and, you know, the bad <laughs> stuff kind of <laughs> falls away. Absolutely. I guess we're coming towards the end of our time together. I feel like we could probably talk for another hour or so. <laughs> but um, I do have one more question, and that is if you could distill everything you've learnt and everything that you teach and maybe everything that you've written <laughs> down into one core lesson, what do you think that one thing would be? It would be that we all have that inner wisdom inside us. It's there even when we can't hear it. And I really want to stress it's there even, even when we don't think we're worthy of it. And it loves us. And we're perfect. And all we need to do is forgive ourselves, forgive others, and get quiet and listen. And that can be the hardest thing of all. But you will save so much money in coaching, in workshops, in paying other people to tell you what you should do if you can learn to listen to that voice yourself. Oh, what a great note to end on. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Alice. As I mentioned at the start, her book, Bad Yogi, is an excellent read. You should definitely check it out. For our next episode, we're speaking with Robin Kamira. I'm pretty excited about this episode because Robin recently wrote the book, Infinite Threads, 100 Indigenous Insights from Old Māori Manuscripts, which takes you on an epic eye-opening journey through a series of 100 interpretations of the wisdoms, stories, and words of old Māori sages. I absolutely love this book. As someone who is Māori and feels slightly disconnected from his Indigenous roots, and for me, this book highlights some of the commonalities between Indigenous and Eastern spirituality. So look out for that episode in two weeks' time. It will be great. Our theme song is Baby Robots by Go Soul and is used with permission. Get his music from gosoul.bandcamp.com. Joe and I would like to honour the elders of these wisdom traditions of yoga and mindfulness from India and other parts of Asia. We also wish to honour the traditional custodians of the unceded land where this podcast is recorded, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. Thank you so much for listening. Joe and I appreciate you spending your precious time with us. Aroha nui. Big, big love.